Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Sales Ops Demystified. We're joined by Ed Statin, uh, who previously has had eight years experience in sales operations at 3M. Now, I didn't actually, I'd obviously heard of 3M, but I wasn't really aware what 3M actually did. And I was researching them this afternoon, and I realized that actually they do a lot of stuff and have a lot of employees. So it's going to be super interesting to dig into that experience. Um, Ed has now left 3M and has moved on to consulting in sales operations. So I'm f I think there's going to be many insights for all the listeners here. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. And I appreciate the brief intro from my previous experience with 3M. And you're right. 3M is a big company that people don't often know about. It's kind of behind the mm -hmm. scenes. My specific responsibility was focusing within the healthcare area of 3M, which is uh, sometimes 3M knows pe people know 3M for tapes and various different other things, but obviously you have a very big healthcare division as well too. And my role was really developing and growing and managing the specific health uh, uh, sales operations program within a couple of specific areas within that division. And what's interesting, and this is something that I think we talked about before, was I had an interesting experience working with them, which is we had all, during that time an ERP integration where we, we were merging over to SAP. So we kind of had the pre-SAP and then we had the post-SAP. So I kind of break up my experience with respect to sales operations, especially with my previous experience with 3M as pre and post, and definitely both of them were great learning experiences. Fantastic. Um, before we jump into the questions, I just want to understand um, the the kind of size of sales operations you were, or your the sales ops team was responsible for. So you said healthcare within 3M. I know 3M right. has something like 60, 70,000 employees. Correct. Um, so what kind of size were you talking? The size that I was managing was approximately 1.2 billion in US dollars. Uh, which was essentially uh, mainly focused on the United States, but I also had some uh, involvement with the international as well, too. So basically within that specific area of 3M, it was about that amount of volume. And obviously uh, a lot of volume that went through various different uh, distribution and channel partners. Got it. And in terms of size of sales organization that was supporting that revenue, you'd have to give us exact numbers. but It's about, it was around 300. Cool, and then you might three hundred exactly. And within my team, and this is a this is a good, and this is something too that people ask me a lot about. What's interesting is is that we we migrated to a couple different models uh, that was had its pros and cons with respect to how we did it. Originally, the team that I managed was all specifically within our uh, division. And I had a couple of different people that supported um, data, obviously, administration, various different things regarding the compensation programs and, and various different other operational programs that tie into sales operations. However, when we went through our business transformation, as I called it, when I was with 3M, we there was a decision, as we called it, was business transformation, where we basically made the decision to basically more centralize a lot of the programs and services, kind of the best in class of trying to centralize it. So I was working with a couple different, uh, we centralized some of the operations and programs, and then from there, really work forward uh, to really optimize those programs. So it was kind of a, a hybrid mixture that I had never really heard before, and it definitely did have its pros and cons. Um, and I say that because I've, in the course of my discussions now in my, you know, as I migrate to my new position and new roles, a lot of people ask about that, especially when they're large organizations that may have multi-divisions is, is there value of having a sales operations program that is more centralized? And I say it really depends depending upon what your objectives are. Nice. So when we say more centralized, we mean a larger company could have, say, five different business areas that so could have five different sales operations team, or they could have one sales operations team that serves all business layers. Exactly. Exactly. Um, awesome. So it's good to like get that context when, when we move into the questions. And let's go into question one, which is how you first got into sales operations. Sure. It's it's an interesting dynamic with respect to my how I migrate into sales operations. The way I always look at sales operations and how people get into this area is there was 
my background has is sales. So I'm a little bit different than a lot of people who may have a background in finance, et cetera. I was sales. I was in national accounts. That's an area that I'm focusing on right now. But what I really had is a good analytical background, an analytical bend, as I call it here in the U.S., where I really had to focus on that. And when I came on board with 3M, there was... And, and I find this and I laugh because so many people can relate to this is that there was a lot of different people that were doing the role of sales operations, but it wasn't in a centralized portion, uh, in a centralized area. So I started out working with a very small division within uh, 3M Healthcare. And over the next couple of years, I started to integrate a lot of the different programs into one cohesive program so that we could work together on developing the common needs for data, uh, compensation, forecasting, all the various different other pieces, as well as the application management area, such as um, I managed the rollout of Salesforce to our team. We had previously worked with Oracle in the past, and then we went to Salesforce from there. So it really is a matter of, you know, and I hear this a lot. Again, I'll repeat myself to what I said before is a lot of organizations do have a very loose organization but then basically then they start integrating a little bit more cohesively and that's where I worked with it so got it um, and I know you, you, you don't currently sit within 3M but the technology you were using when you were at 3M um, you've mentioned FAP, you mentioned Salesforce. Were there any other tools that you guys were using? Sure. There was a lot of different, there was obviously from a contracting perspective, we had good contracting price tools that we had into place. We had some uh, sales forecasting tools that we had integrated in as part of the SAP package. So we were really using a lot of different pieces. And, you know, in Salesforce, I really focused on the basics of utilizing Salesforce. Um, there's a lot of a lot of great tools, add-ons, various different things that you know can be aligned to how you're using Salesforce. But early on, I said let's try to maximize the functionalities of what Salesforce can offer before we start seeing about some of the add-on pieces to that. So basically, my role was really focusing on that to maximize the effectiveness of Salesforce. Got it. And we have a question from the audience, uh, Zach. Hi, what, Zach. <laughs> so what is the biggest challenge in your role? I, I think we should switch up to, to what was the biggest challenge when you were at 3M? The, the biggest challenge, and again, it, and it doesn't matter if it's a large company or it's a small company, is alignment between the different teams. The way I look at sales operations, it's a bridge. Um, I saw a real funny t-shirt the other day on, um, I think it was LinkedIn that talked about, you know, sales, uh, sales operations is basically the epitome of the go-to person when it comes down to managing so many crucial pieces. And for me, it was really getting alignment with all the various different people that sales operation touches. Um, when it comes down to the sales field, when it comes down to finance, when it comes down to the VP of sales, it really was making sure that everybody was aligned to what we wanted to do from a sales operations perspective. Great question, Zach. <laughs> and how did you, like many people have come on and said that, and I totally get it, how if all these disparate teams and sales operations is like the glue. Do you have any tips for that stakeholder management? Like, How do you keep everybody happy when you only have limited resources? It is. It, it comes down to the consistent communication and coming down to what are the define, definables that everybody will be happy with. For example, uh, one of the things that I did, and this wasn't necessarily with 3M, but in a past life, is we used to get a report every Monday that was 20 pages of data. And there was always some people who certain pieces fit some people didn't but the reality was was 90 percent of it wasn't being used so what i did is i worked with the effect the different teams and said listen let's let's figure this out if 90 percent of this isn't being used why do we work why do we get this report out let's figure out one standard template that everybody will be comfortable with that we can use as our basis and then work forward from there and that was one case where I really worked with all the various different team members to really say, how do we develop the most effective teams uh, to, to develop all these programs together? And that really was, it comes down to it, because you're right, um, 
especially when you have different folks who have different objectives, different different targets, it is tough. But I think that when you build the relationships, you build the consistencies, that's where you start developing the, uh, the success. I was a big fan, and I still continue to be a big fan in my new role, is uh, developing good processes that everybody is comfortable with. For example, with Salesforce, I didn't want Salesforce to be a tool that was just turning out reports, I wanted it to be a tool that the sales team used and I wanted it to be a tool that the sale, that leadership had as well too, but what I wanted to find was that balance. So I put together a playbook that everybody could use that really said, here are the things that we're all going to agree upon and that made it a lot easier so that everybody was happy with how we were managing Salesforce. Nice. Um, data quality, I can only imagine the complexity of different stakeholders and data within your Salesforce org at 3M. Yeah. Um, who guys responsible for maintaining that? Or, and what yeah. was the yeah. process? Yeah, exactly. My historical role was, you know, and again, it's, a, um, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate out to this. We had multiple, multiple, multiple channel partners that were sending across data information. Some of it was going through well-established portals such as GHX. Some were going through very, you know, historical means. We were still getting some information that was still being faxed to us. So <laughs> it was um, at one point I think that we were, I was I was uh, managing about 300, and this was pre-SAP, 300 different channel partners. Uh, that was sending in information. So you're right, it was a challenge. And some of that information, and the good thing is, is I had to look at it in two ways. And I think that with most people who listen to this as the same way, the reality was, was that I would say about 90% of my true, my data was coming through maybe top three partners, channel partners, or top three customers. That's the reality, and that's what I see with most people as well. So I basically worked through really making sure that the data quality from my top partners were the ones that was as clean as possible. I think that anybody who's out there who's listening to this and you're getting data from a variety of different sources, it is impossible to be able to get you know, the data 100% clean. It's, you know, as I often say to other people, data can be very gray. You know, as much as we say data is data, it sometimes can be a very gray process with respect to how you manage it. So I really focused on that and really made sure that the core data that we were getting in the core information was as clean as possible. And I work with the other partners and the other teams to it to see what we could do uh, working through that. Now, when we went post, SAP migration, which I'm sure there are some people who've gone through that as well too, is SAP, the benefits of that, it was a lot more streamlined. There's a lot more rules in place. So we did have to make sure that beforehand as part of our deployment that we had all this built in. So that made in some ways a lot easier, but in some cases it made it a little bit difficult too because for our smaller channel partners, if they weren't able to be compliant with that, we had to make special allowances for them to get that information in. Got it. Um, we already spoke about stakeholder management. I want to talk about specifically one group of very important stakeholders, which is your sales people. Mm -hmm. um, when trying to get them to do something, have something new or something different, how, well, what were your strategies to do that? And how did you get them to buy into the thing that you Exactly. Wanted? It is all about, uh, again, this is where I think my background at sales comes handy with that is, is really identifying first and foremost, how is it going to benefit them? Uh, you know, and what is it going to be the positive? And, you know, earlier we talked about Salesforce. Um, I was very happy with our deployment. I think that we, the way I measured it, we were about 90% compliant with respect to our sales team utilizing it. And this is including, you know, some obviously very well tenured people that, you know, had never used a program such as that before. So what you have to do and what I did was really define out very concretely what the you know what the positives are with something such as Salesforce what are some of the positives with respect to anything that we're doing with respect to what we're asking about for example uh, the other thing that we were rolling out was specific campaigns marketing campaigns within Salesforce and 
the campaigns that we were rolling out was in coordination with the sales team to ensure that they knew what the value was of that. So I think constant uh, engagement is, is key. The other thing too, and this is where I kind of balance it between the carrot and the stick approach, because there I'm talking about the carrot. The other thing too that I talked about with leadership was if we had an expectation for them to build in a specific KPI or specific objective in terms of what we did, I did ask that that be built into their MBOs or their specific definables within that's expected of them. So in, in all organizations, I'm sure they have performance reviews. And what I recommended was as part of their performance review, if there were some specifics built into that. I think that's a very big thing to build into it because yes, you may have a sales rep that is exceeding a, a their uh, their quota, but what we would then build into it is yes. But did you also make sure that Salesforce that you were you know keeping your pipeline up to date? Were you working on the specific campaign? Were you focusing on this other important initiative that we're doing? So that was something that really Im important that you balance between that. What's in it for them? from a positive perspective, how it can support growing their business and working with the customers, and how is it internally going to be important for them to be able to, at the end of the year, achieve what's expected of them from a performance review perspective. The carrot and the stick. Yes. Um, quickly moving on to sales forecasting. Um, within your uh, pillar or area of 3M, were, was your team responsible for actually forecasting the sales, or were you guys giving the sales managers or leadership the tools to do that? It both, both. I think that we had, you know, we had tools that helped, you know, identify in terms of what was going on in the marketplace, what were some of the growth factors. One of the things that we were also, sometimes too, what's, what's interesting is for anyone who worked on different ones, we got a lot of forecast information from them as well too. So it really was a close integrated working relationship. And that's why I love sales operations so much is because you are working with a lot of different people. So we were providing, at least I was, you know, uh, working with the various different team members to align with forecasting, to make sure that what we were doing was aligned with it. Sometimes, you know, finance would, would come and say, hey, listen, we need a such and such percentage growth factor. And then we'd work together and say, okay, this is what we can think we can do for this particular product area. And what can we do with respect to overall growth for a specific area that, uh, that I have responsibility for at that time? Got it. And one more question about that on a, on a micro level. Say you were working with an individual rep on their forecast. Do you take into account the bias that a rep may have. So, you know, a rep's like super optimistic and every week or every month he over forecasts. Do you do, do anything to their forecast to, to modify that? My approach was actually to work with a manager. Uh, what we built into Salesforce, and that was okay. a good question, and what we built into working with their various different, is, is developing a cadence of, build, of looking at what they have in the pipeline. So you're right. If they're saying that they're going to be closing a million dollars next month and the average sale is 25000 US dollars, then obviously that is a question, you know, then you have to do that. And that's something that what we would do is not necessarily go to each different rep. We would basically look at it and say, manager, you know, um, you know, this is how your funnel is looking and, you know, and then they would be, would work with the respective rep. The other thing that I would pull into Salesforce too is looking at, you know, obviously I had standard uh, template, standard reports that I would look at. And if something did stand out, then obviously, yes, if someone was saying that they had this huge one and then the next sale was 85% less than that, what that one was, then we would be, you know, we, we would obviously then didn't work with the rep to see what you, and sometimes too, as we all know, there's mistakes. You know, and it, but that's where we really have to develop that cadence. But what we liked and what I liked doing was making sure that the managers were developing that weekly, you know, review to ensure that what people were entering in was the most accurate as possible. Got it. Um, onboarding salespeople, do you have any best practices or things that have or yeah, haven't I am, um, your, your this is, I'm a member here. So if any of you are familiar with the, um, 
I, here in the U.S., the Twin Cities, as we call it, St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis area, it's really a hub of probably the biggest concentration of, you know, various different uh, small manufacturers, device manufacturers, and things like that. They've really encouraged a lot of growth. So what we've built here is a sales enablement society to really focus on onboarding tools and various different things. And and we've talked about, you know, onboarding. And for me, what I historically have done is really looked at it in four phases. Um, the first phase when you talk about any onboarding program is ensuring that wh whoever is coming on board that you have a well-defined plan laid out for them. And one of the things that I want to make sure of is that they know week by week what they're doing in terms of the various different training portions. So I divided it into four main fo focus portions. One is, and this is something too that the sales operations program, you know, basically developed a little bit more. And then again, it's based upon some historic, you know, programs that were set up within my within 3M Healthcare. But it was also too kind of looking at best practices, you know, across with other companies. And the four phases was first was was phase one, which was a basic onboarding program, which was getting the person on board, making sure that they're, you know, they've got all the tools they need. Sometimes. It's a simple thing that if they got an iPhone or if they got a new phone, we want to make sure that everything is set up well. We also give them basic training on that. I think any one of the biggest mistakes that I hear that I often see is that you know when someone's hired is you want to make sure you have that personalization. So when you have that personalization and you're bringing them on board, the comfort level helps them to be happier in the th in terms of being more adjusted. The second phase of this was the onboarding training of the new product services, various different types of things. What we did is we did a lot of e-learning, but as we all know, and I follow on the, the 70-20-10 rule, which is people learn by doing. So any training that we were doing, we were bringing them in, we made sure that it was being practical in terms of they were learning by doing. So we focused on micro learning, which was no session was more than 20 minutes. We kind of kept them up and moving and we, we were working with that. The third phase was field training. So making sure that we had a very defined program where they were working side by side with field mentors, uh, side by side with people who understood the industry, understood what they were focusing on. And, and usually they would be out there for almost a full week. And that was probably one of our most successful aspects of it. And then the final program was really bringing them back and really, as I call it, was the bringing it all together, which was incorporating everything that they've learned from the last time that they were going through the basic fundamental trainings, integrating some advanced um, onboarding training. You know, again, I use various different training programs for business. And then I also did advanced uh, product training so that when they have the when they came back, we had a very well-defined program. And again, still using the auspices of, you know, micro learning. But even after they got done with this, what we were doing was we still had a plan week by week to make sure that they were, they every week they knew what they were supposed to be doing. So that's really the program that I've continued to focus on, and especially in my new role as, as I'm working forward on this, is really making sure that you have that type of integration, which is making sure that there's the person to person, there's the e-learning, as well as there is the, you know, in-face, and then all the other different programs that, that you really transpired to be an effective sales training program. Got it. Um, so we've onboarded the salesperson. In their role, how were you making your reps at 3M more so productive? We, there were a lot of, and I hesitated here because when I was thinking about it is, is there's good tools and then there's tools that they don't need it. And, you know, very early on, I think what's working with all the various different team members, and again, this is one of the reasons why I love sales operations so much, is you work with marketing. You work with the various different development team members. So when we onboarded any new sales rep, any new person that was coming on board that was, you know, that we had responsibility for, for onboarding, we made sure that they had a couple different tools that could give them 
access as quickly as possible to not only the products and services, but also the support people. Uh, we rolled out a specific sales aid um, that had all the products and services on an iPad, and they made sure that they had access to that at any given time. And then continuous reinforcement of the training was also a key portion of that, is that, you know, I talked about the syllabus we would put together, is that we have consistent tools, um, different things that we would send out to them on a consistent basis on new training, new different programs. And then the other thing, too, is that we would make sure that we were working with marketing and the any other people that were supplying new product information about continuous onboarding and continuous education about new things that people have learned about the product, new things that they've learned about, you know, obviously solutions, new approaches to customers, um, you know, working through various different options such as that. Got it. Um, what is your favorite sales KPI? Hmm. Define a little bit more when you mean sales KPI, because that, that, that's kind of an open-ended question, depending <laughs> upon who you ask. Yeah. So the, so the question I'm supposed to ask, or the question I normally ask, is what KPIs are you tracking for your reps? Um, okay, good. Cool. <laughs> but I switched it up, and I... <laughs> And so, I mean, you don't have to give me your favorite, but what do you think is an important metric to track? Good. To the easy answer is, and that's why I asked you about that, is if they're making plan. You know, and if, if, if it comes back down to if you gave them an 8.5% growth target and they're doing it 9.6% growth target, then great. Then, you know, that, and, and that's an easy answer, but that's, and that's something that every organization, at the end of the day, it comes down to is, um, what is the definable goals and are they achieving it? So, but for me, KPIs take it a little bit more in terms of that. We talked about the value of Salesforce. We talked about the value of various different other things they can do in terms of that. I have a lot of, um, in, you know, experience in the SaaS area as well too, working with solution software systems. So with solution software systems, you know, again, some of these things take two to three years to materialize. So some of the KPIs that I've built into it is specific to Findable metrics or milestones that you need to have to do to make sure that the sale is progressing the way it does. So there are a lot of different ways of building KPIs. It really depends on A, the type of product that you're focusing on. If it's a simple, again, I'll say commodity-based product where you know that you know, you're going to see a definable value volume on that, or if it's a software solution that you know that's going to take up two to three years to materialize, developing those specific metrics, uh, guidelines that you know that you're going to have to keep on tracking. So there's a lot of different ways of tracking it. And again, it depends on what type of product or portfolio you're managing at the time. Got it. So you can't give us uh, I'm gonna, a I'm going to say I've worked with a couple <laughs> different ones, and I, you know, and that's that's where I think. Mm. The, the metrics that I've always felt is really comes down to how you as an organization are looking at what your desired outcomes are, okay? Got it. And, and then that determines what your exactly. favorite or most exactly. important Exactly, because metric. I've looked at a lot of different, you know, systems, programs, very different things. But it really, I really try to keep it as simple as possible, you know, and you get, going back to the data component of it is, Understanding at the end of the day, what is your desired outcome? And once you have an idea of that, then you start building from there. Got it. And to round everything up, um, who has taught you what, you're, what you know, or who would you like to take, take for lunch uh, related to sales? So there are a couple of different people that I've really had the benefit of working with. Um, one of the, the, the greatest people that I've started to work with now is, um, is the people, and again, it's, it's, it's an individual who's starting to take, when we talk about onboarding, we talked about sales enablement. Uh, there's a gentleman that I'm starting to work with uh, that is talking about how do you take sales enablement and sales enablement programs to the next level. Um, and how do you develop specific metrics on what you're doing? So, so for example, you know, the previous question you asked me was about onboarding. So onboarding is something that, you know, how do you know if you're successful? I mean, is it six months? Is it, are they hitting quota within the first month? Are they delivering the milestones? Those are the different things. So 
the individuals that I'm working with now and the one that I would like to take to launch and looking forward to it is how those people continue to take sales operations and sales enablement to the next level. Got it. Yes. So exactly. anyone pushing yeah. boundaries. And they, you, like you know, the, the organization, for example, that I have, you know, been, been focusing with uh, is, you know, Liquid Smarts is someone who's really saying, what is it that we need to do to not just take training, but take it to the next level with respect to various different onboarding training programs, you know, things such as that. And that's, and that's where I think it's really critical when we talk about addressing such a key portion of under the sales operations banner, which is sales enablement, onboarding, training, whatever you call it with respect to that. Got it. Um, so let me share a couple of things I thought were quite impactful. Um, interesting how, because you have, you have the background in sales, right? And then you, you notice or you realize you have this analytical bent and that helped your transition into the sales mm -hmm. role. So I picked up on that. Uh, sales off being the bridge between all these different stakeholders. The 80-20 rule, mm -hmm. you didn't say that, but that's what I kind of got. Incoming data light. It's not always going to be perfect. It's a great area. And so the, your top three sources focus on those. Um, and then finally, something we hadn't had before was where, like the carrot and the stick method for uh, influencing salespeople, understanding what's in it for them, but also actually working with C level or like higher stakeholders uh -huh. to tweak performance metrics. So the, the stick part and so that's the, this pronged approach thank you and, and that really yeah. and again and it's interesting when we talk about compensation programs because this is where when you and i've had a lot of experience working with various different types of compensation programs is i think to have a successful compensation program you do need to have that alignment with not only in terms of if, if they're a sales driven organization, what they're doing, but if you have other objectives in terms of growing the business that's not as numbers oriented, but you still need to have their engagement, that's where it's critical that you build those those things into it as well, too, as part of performance reviews. And I don't think there's any company at this point that does not have a very you know structured uh, performance review process that incorporates not only just how you're doing from a metrics perspective, but the other things from whether you call it an MBO process or anything else, it really comes down to how you're building those in so that every sales rep or any person who's under that program knows exactly what they're supposed to be uh, focusing on and they know what they're going to be judged on at the end of the year. Fantastic, Ed, a fountain of knowledge. Thank you so much for your insight. I'm um, just above this video, if you're watching on the blog, or type Ed's Ed in Ebster into Google, you'll come to the landing page, and you can click through to Ed's LinkedIn profile, and if you have any questions, I'm Certainly sure happy to help, Ed and like I answer. said, I appreciate the time. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I think it's an exciting time for everyone. As I talk with different organizations, sales operations, sales enablement, all these different areas continues to explode. Um, I'm working with a lot of different people now, and it's very exciting. So please, anyone who wants to reach out to me on my LinkedIn profile, I'm happy to do so. And again, with my you know other partners that I'm working with right now, happy to obviously be able to support in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. Ed, thank you so Pleasure much for your time.